Welcome to this lecture on mental models. I'm Dr. Corey Facleris at the University of North Carolina at Charlotte. Today, I hope you'll understand, first of all, what we mean when we say mental models. And second, I hope that you'll be able to identify specific mental models that are useful in security and privacy. Now, previously, I've recommended a three-prong approach to usable security that we make security invisible where possible, that we offer better user interfaces based on our research and what we understand about humans, and finally, that we train users where necessary. And we know also from the research we've talked about previously, for instance, that experts and non-experts have different ideas about what they should do to stay safe online, where experts recommended using password managers, updating software and using two-factor authentication most often. And non-experts recommended using strong passwords, yay, to not share private information, also important, and to use antivirus software, maybe not so important. Well, those are examples of uh, how mental models help to speed up our reasoning, for instance. Those are mental models that people have about what they should do about security and privacy. Mental models are simplified representations of reality that allow people to interact with the world. And it also talks, it relates to how pe a person reasons and makes inferences about a problem or situation, such as what to do about their security and privacy concerns. Finally, mental models allow people to make predictions and decisions very easily. Now I'll say this about mental models, they are functional Rarely are they complete, and rarely are they completely accurate. And that's because complete, accurate reasoning is hard work. So here's an example, for instance, where sometimes we'll encounter uh, in, a, in a bathroom, say, there's two knobs, say, for hot and cold water. So that's one mental model you might have grown up with of how to interact with a sink or a or shower. But of course, sometimes then we're traveling and we encounter a different type of handle. And maybe that's got everything integrated into one handle. Of course, the problem is the more complicated that is, and especially if it's new to you, you don't realize how to work it. And actually you might mess up and create some hot water where you didn't want it or cold water where you didn't want it. And that harks back to what we talked about before with the gulfs of evaluation and execution. So there's where mental models play a role. It affects what we're expecting, for instance, and also what is our internal diagram say of how a system is going to work. And of course, we're gonna adjust that based on how it actually works in practice. Knowing users' mental models helps us improve usability. We can improve our designs. And we can also think about how to educate people differently if we can meet them where they are. So an example is the common assumption that say only very important people are targets. That can be leveraged um, for a security firm's marketing corp communications, for instance. So here's a diagram from Proofpoint of what they call very attacked people. So they turn it on its head and they think it's not just about who's important, it's who's actually being attacked by attackers. And actually they found that um, in this case, while well, most people might assume that the CEO, for instance, would be attacked, actually say client services, in a financial firm, it would be a mortgage loan originator. Um, it might not be the CEO, but the executive assistant to the CEO. And also people who have other things to do with finance in particular, such as a credit analyst or loan underwriting for this regional bank. This is just to point out that we have this idea that the people with titles or for, uh, people uh, influence um, might be attacked, but also sometimes it's the people who have administrative power or also who are very overloaded and are going to think very carefully, say, about certain emails. So to learn people's mental models, we're going to apply methods from human-centered design. People are biased and not entirely aware, and their models are not complete. So best practice is to employ a mix of methods to try to figure out what they're thinking. We can, first of all, ask people directly about their thoughts and perceptions. We can also observe what they do in response to situations. And we can do things such as use artifacts or what I would call design probes 
to elicit maybe their less conscious beliefs. And that's because sometimes we're not very reflective or we're not very conscious of things that are actually in the back of our minds, but maybe don't rise to conscious awareness. Some examples of mental models documented in studies include for viruses that say maybe they're just bad stuff, um, maybe that they're buggy software, that viruses represent mischief, or that viruses support crime. And for hackers, uh, for, for big mental models found, such as that hackers um, do things like digital graffiti, that hackers are burglars, uh, and then there's the big fish model, very similar to burglar, that and the very attacked person model that you have to be a big fish in order to be hacked. And also that hackers are contractors to criminals. Now, entertainment media can help spread these particular mental models on this slide. For instance, um, hearkening back to what was on the previous slide, that hackers have specific important targets, that they're not sometimes just cruising around looking for ports or accounts that might be weakly defended. Another mental model we see a lot in films and movies is that attacks and unsafe situations are obvious, right? So for instance, you might see flashing screens in a video clip. clip. Um, and in real life, of course, sometimes it's definitely not obvious. Another mental model that's been found is this idea that encryption is fragile and all security measures are futile. Now, of course, this is a real oversimplification. It's not really correct, but we see this re repeated a lot in films and movies. Another mental model that comes to people's minds based on what they see on television may be that, that unplugging and other simple actions are going to resolve your security problems. Um, there's a video clip um, in the video that's assigned here where um, they mention, you know, there are some instances where that actually can help with some technical problems, but really not for end user security problems. Of course, you know, say somebody's actively draining files from your computer, sure, unplug the computer. Now, the final mental model that we see in entertainment media are that suspicious emails can be dangerous, and it's correct. Screenwriters got it right. So people learn mental models through entertainment media, but also other ways too. A lot of times it's through your personal experiences. You might hear about other people's experiences. Sometimes you transfer a model from one situation to another. And sometimes we deliberately try to create correct mental models through education or awareness campaigns. In fact, metaphors are very common in security mental models. And sometimes we borrow the model from certain domains such as uh, physical mental models. We talk about rooms or vaults or keys. In the medical domain, that's where viruses, that word comes from. We, you know, we talk about the way things spread and about, say, needing to purge infections. In the criminal domain, we borrow some mental models such as prosecution, intrusion, stealing things, surveillance. From warfare, I see a lot of mental models in security, such as this idea of firewalls, that you're demilitarizing zones, um, this idea certainly of terrorism associated with cybercrime, and that there are coordinated attacks. And finally, we have some mental models from the markets, such as things about money, economic costs, time, and that the general idea, which is correct, that security requires resources. So some examples of how to leverage mental models would be um, through labels or text on an interface, um, how we construct our warnings, how we also decide to write guidance, explanations, or help in an application, Yes, how we construct our education and awareness campaigns, how we write and design our training materials. And of course, we want to make sure to spread correct information and help the news and media to get it right when they depict security and privacy. Thank you for listening.